to be going live and we are recording now. Excellent. Brilliant. So, um, welcome back everyone um, to um, the third of our uh, book uh, launches uh, series. Um, as I have been saying now uh, for our two past events, um, I think in these um, times of uh, pandemic, um, going back to exploring this as, a, this as an opportunity to pick up a book and, 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 and read something to widen our spirit in, in, as we wait to find yet again some measure of normality is perhaps one of the most useful and sort of um, stimulating opportunities that uh, we have. And I am delighted today uh, to welcome uh, Jeremy Yellen um, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and even though the format, uh, the webinar format we were discussing this moments ago, um, one of the advantages is that, that, that it's a lot easier in this type of format to have conversation um, with, um, uh, about books and with authors uh, that otherwise would be slightly more complicated. Um, and, and today I'm particularly pleased because um, I am sure that the seminar is, uh, this, this, this webinar is going to be a success. Uh, because of the book and because of the author, but certainly we can say I am happy to say that it's probably going to be the uh, it's going down in history as the most aptly timed webinar ever, since um, I've just finished like two minutes ago uh, teaching a class on this very um, topic, um, the topic of the Jamas Empire during wartime. So um, I'm very pleased that that uh, um, hopefully this will be the beginning of a nice conversation that we'll have uh, throughout the hour. And if some of our students sort of um, um, uh, elect to, to join us. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy completed his PhD at um, Harvard University before moving uh, to Hong Kong. Um, and um, he, um, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, I have the impression that uh, uh, you belong to the group of, 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 of historians of Japan, of modern Japan, um, that really sort of um, uh, have been very important in populating the transhistorian space, right? That 1945, uh, moment. It's not a break, it's not where things sort of end or begin, but needs to be placed into a broader context. Um, and a lot of Jeremy's earlier research um, is really designed to flesh out some core issues, whether it is about how the Japanese uh, military and government elites decided to um, change course of action in 1945, um, how the war was understood, perceived among people in Japan during the wartime period. And then again, um, some of these threads come together in the book that you can see on the shelf um, and my back, um, um, which um, is, is fascinating for a number of reasons. But from my perspective, it does something that was absolutely missing in the storytelling of the empire. And is, is exploring the empire from the perspective of the places that are, that become part of the empire during the war. And therefore these are the places where initial ideas uh, that are uh, coming together um, in, in a peacetime condition, um, sort of come to clash uh, with the reality of, of total war. So for me, it, it's an exciting opportunity to engage with a topic that, that, that is not only sort of fascinating from an intellectual point of view, but also extremely timely, because the repercussions of that sort of, of that negotiation, of that sort of encounter between wartime Japan and the periphery of this newly acquired and expanded empire, uh, the, the impact of all of that continues, continues to live with us today. And so it is a, it's a wonderful opportunity to throw us through a book that historically introduces us to the complexity of a reality that continues to exist today. Um, so for this reason, I am absolutely uh, uh, thrilled uh, to have Jeremy and to welcome him at, at King's. I'm looking forward to, for, to, to, uh, to your presentation. Um, we agree that that's 25 minutes roughly, uh, give or take, to introduce some of the threads in the book. Then we'll start having a conversation and opening up the floor to everybody. Um, what I would like to say is that, um, um, as usual, you can uh, use the Q&A function, which will be the designated, this designated natural function for uh, questions, if you want to ask questions or submit comments. But feeling that, you can also use the chat, which I will be uh, monitoring throughout. Without any further ado, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Again, welcome to King's. 
Okay, um, thank you for such a wonderfully kind introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate being invited out by Dr. Patalano and by King's College London, uh, London as well as the um, Grand, what is it called? The, the Center for Grand Strategy, that's what it's called. Um, let me share my screen first. And um, I have a PowerPoint today. I think it'll be easiest to just start with this. Hold on. Um, you can see this, right? Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> I'm excited to have the chance to talk about my book today, and I'm honored really to be the, the last in this term as well. And I've, um, I have been given 20 to 25 minutes to give this talk, um, but I'm going to err on the side of brevity. That way we can, because obviously the um, Q&A is always much more interesting than the talk itself. But before I even begin my talk, um, hold on a second. Before I even begin, why is this not working? Ah, uh, here we go. I'd like to plug my book. Um, I've given so many talks where I forgot to plug my own book. So I decided this time I'm going to create a slide and um, do so with the discount code, you know, on it for you guys. So um, if you if you are available, you can just take a screenshot of this. Um, but uh, 09 flyer or if you're in the UK or Europe or Asia, CS09 flyer, and that will get you 30% off. So I think the Center for Grand Strategy is going to follow up by sending out discount details after the talk, but better safe than sorry. So I can guarantee to you guys that this is the best book I have ever written, and that's the best plug I'm going to give myself. All right, so let's start talking about the book. So my book is on the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Um, it was declared on August 1st, 1940, by Japan's foreign minister at the time, Matsuo Kiyosuke. By the following year, July 1941, the co-prosperity sphere became the central goal of Japanese policy. What's really interesting here is that this is despite the fact that very few people had any clue as to the specifics. Um, after the outbreak of the Pacific War in December 1941, the sphere, which um, it got to be quite big as you can see here, it became the epitome of Japan's wartime goals. Still, this did not mean that people agreed about what it meant. But since the end of the war, the co-prosperity sphere has had a much, much, much longer life. And it's become the euphemism for a specific understanding of Japanese imperialism, and a specific understanding of Japanese order building. So this is a concept that actually has had a longer and more powerful post-war life than Matsuoka could have ever imagined. Um, a Washington Post editorial in 1988 hinted that Japanese businessmen across Asia were now seeking to recreate Japan's failed co-prosperity sphere by economic means. And more recently, people have begun to notice strong parallels you can see right here, China's new Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. So strong parallels between China's Belt and Road Initiative and Xi Jinping's Community of Common Destiny. They're using the same terms that was used in the 1940s. And it, so there's linkages to the present. So for better or for worse, I think the co-prosperity sphere has provided a language um, from which Asia has, and the world, has really drawn. And so it was this power behind the slogan and the power behind Japan's wartime empire that drew me to this topic. And I, as I was researching it, I saw contemporary Chinese efforts at promoting regionalism, regionalism 2.0, I guess. So my research became even more interesting. And the prospects of telling the story about what the co-prosperity sphere is, it became even more interesting when I started seeing more and more evidence that wartime leaders did not agree or even know what the co-prosperity sphere was. Much of the war was spent groping towards its possibilities. So today I'm going to use this as my lens and my opportunity to talk about um, some of the main points of my book, not all, of course. 
So I believe that um, the co-prosperity sphere, and I argued that it's more than a simple economic block. It's more than a, a simple slogan for imperialism or Pan-Asian ideology. It was also a reaction to the challenges of diplomacy and empire in the 1930s. And it was a sincere attempt to envision a new type of political and economic order for the region. And so I argue that the co-prosperity sphere is best understood as a contested and negotiated process of envisioning the future during a time of total war. And it happened not only in Japan, but in occupied territories as well. I argue this in my book by telling two stories. Um, the first story is the story, I'm, and together I'm telling a political history of empire. The first story is about high policy in Japan. For Japan, the co-prosperity sphere is really the story of imagining a regional order that was to take shape after the end of the war. But it never consolidated into a system or an ideology. And if you guys are interested, we can talk about this later. It was never a true grand strategy either. It was constantly in flux. It was hazy. It was vague or subject to debates among core agencies, thinkers, and policymakers. Policymakers only agreed upon the central goals for the sphere from 1943, by which time it was almost impossible to implement. So for Japan, the, the, the sphere was, um, I guess, a history of failure, a failed process of building Asia anew. My book also um, focuses on the reception in Southeast Asia. I focus on two independent dependencies, one Burma and the other the Philippines. I'm not going to talk about why I chose those two, so if you have a question you can ask me why I chose those two. So for Southeast Asian elites in Burma and the Philippines, the co-prosperity sphere is a different story. It's in part the story of shepherding their countries to an independent future in the era of decolonization that followed the war. So in all, the co-prosperity sphere was brutal and oppressive, but it also brought, to varying degrees, opportunity. Um, Burmese and Filipino elites, they collaborated in caretaker governments or newly independent regimes. And it was in this that they pursued efforts at state building, where they gained broader experience in national governments. And in the process, they strove to co-opt Japan's empire for anti-colonial ends. So these are the two stories my talk will focus on, and they're the two stories that are told in my book. So historians and political scientists, they often talk about the co-prosperity sphere as a real thing, as if Japan had a plan that it sought to institute for the region. There were plans. I, I don't disagree with that. There were many plans. The plans were a dime a dozen, but they were never finished products. So the co-prosperity sphere was a moving target. It meant different things to different people at different times. So instead of talking um, about the sphere as a, th a single entity, it was more um, a contest or a fight for visions for the future. And those fights, the, the phases on which these fights happened or conflicts happened, um, you can see on this slide. I'm not going to talk about this slide much I'll, um, because I'll go into, in depth into each one. I'll talk about these three phases before I move on to a discussion of Burma and the Philippines. All right, phase one was with foreign, a foreign minister, Matsuoka Yosuke. He was the person who had the clearest vision at least initially, for the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. So what was Matsuoka's co-prosperity sphere? Well, for him, it was the central component of his foreign policy. It was the, central, it was the centerpiece. Matsuoka believed that the world would break up into a number of blocks led by strong states. Japan would have its block, the Soviet Union, um, Europe would be under Germany and Italy, the British Empire, parts of that were for the taking, and the United States as well. So Matsuoka then tried to build Japan's Greater East Asia sphere through what I talk of as, or I call it, sphere of influence diplomacy. And he advanced this upon becoming 
foreign minister. In August and September of 1940, he pushed for the Axis Pact with Germany, really, with Germany and Italy. But it was to gain from Germany diplomatic recognition of Japan's preeminent position in Asia. This was actually a major reason why Japan declared the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere to begin with. In doing so, it was giving notice that its interests extended to greater Asia. And I guess we could talk about what that means in the Q&A, what greater Asia means. Um, yeah, I'm signposting you guys for Q&A. So if you're interested, you can just ask all the questions that I'm telling you to ask. Or you don't have to do that if you don't want to. But from this point on, Matsuoka sought to extend Japan's new order to Southeast Asia through bilateral agreements, and also by convincing the great powers to respect Japan's regional hegemony. This was the basis for Matsuoka's diplomacy. Um, the most important thing he did was um, try to get recognition of the co-prosperity sphere from the great powers. The linchpin of this strategy was not the United States, it was the Soviet Union. He made his whirlwind trip to Europe in March and April of 1941, not to bring about a quadripartite pact, but um, instead to bring about greater acceptance for spheres of influence. And he was strikingly successful. In Moscow, he secured a five-year treaty of neutrality. He got a pledge to respect spheres of influence as well. Uh, Japan's was in Manchuria and the Soviet Union's was in the Mongolian People's Republic. This was his sphere of influence strategy and it was only to be the beginning but Matsuoka's efforts died a quick death just as he was sobering up from his drunken train ride home from Moscow station. Nonetheless, his time was critical. The idea of the sphere, it actually thrived after Matsuoka's fall. By July 1941, it had become the central goal of Japanese policy tied to Japan's self-existence and self-defense. And the ideal of building the sphere, it played a role in Japan's descent to war with the Allied powers. Phase two happened during the Greater East Asia War. It was only after Japan's war for greater, and by the way, I'm not like a mad right-wing nationalist, but uh, in many ways, it makes more sense for my project to call the war, the Greater East Asia War, as opposed to the Pacific War, but I use them interchangeably. But anyways, it was after Japan's war for greater East Asia began that um, the sphere began to take on a new life. This makes sense. Japan was at war. It needed to plan or prepare for what came after. And as you can see from this map, um, Japan's early advance, it happened quite rapidly. The rapid advance and the euphoria that it created, it kind of injected new life into ideas for the sphere. So what happened? Well, strikingly, strikingly for me, and this is what really interested me, um, leading policymakers were still unclear as to what it was. Uh, there was a liaison conference between government and imperial headquarters in late February 1942, where Prime Minister Tojo Hideki, the man who's charged with creating the co-prosperity sphere, he, need, he felt it necessary to ask a question. What is the co-prosperity sphere and how is it different from a defense sphere? What's even more astonishing than the question was the lack of any real response. The members of the conference, um, and they were the de facto decision-making group in wartime Japan, they thought that, or they agreed that further study was necessary. This was astonishing to me. I'm gonna give one more example, and I'll try to be short with it. Um, the Greater East Asia Construction Council was a governmental council that convened from February 1942 to plan for the future of Asia. Um, one committee man, O Tani Kozui, he, um, he could not understand what it was. He complained that the government had not provided a convincing definition. Uh, I'm gonna start from the middle. He says, I don't know where it is. Interpreting from a narrow sense, the co-prosperity sphere is composed of Manchuria and China. But before we knew it, it had become a co-prosperity sphere in greater East Asia. I have absolutely no understanding what greater East Asia is deeper thinking was sorely needed. So it was necessity that bred imagination. 
um, from 1942, the, a broad discussion had begun to articulate different possibilities for the co-prosperity sphere. So in this sense, it was the outbreak of war for Greater East Asia that forced policymakers and intellectuals to uh, contemplate what Japan ought to achieve with the new order. And I'm not going to talk about the many visions that emerged. Um, many of the groups that, that created them were the groups on this slide, but there were a number of recurring themes. Um, all visions were both political and economic. They all saw the future international order as an organic hierarchy under Japan and all called for, um, I guess you could call it exploitative development, where they would create a regional economy that would serve Japan's needs, that's exploitation of course, but also modernize or develop Greater East Asia and unite it into a productive whole. So in the end, these were just visions. They were nothing more. They were not implemented into policy. Aside from the creation of the Greater East Asia Ministry, which is pictured here, and that was the only thing that the Tojo cabinet accomplished during the first year of the war, the closest Japan came to crafting a new policy for the sphere was with this Greater East Asia Construction Council. But there were disagreements at the council between the Commerce Ministry and the Cabinet Planning Board. And those disagreements ended up leading them to produce a watered down document that served as little more than reference material. So at the height of Japan's wartime successes, when it looked like Japan could overtake Asia, the co-prosperity sphere remained a vague, abstract idea. In fact, the ruling elite could not decide on what the co-prosperity sphere meant until it was almost too late to create. What led leaders to finally agree was geopolitical crisis. Um, this is actually a picture from 1942, but it kind of highlights Japan's um, geopolitical crisis. Because by 1943, the war was not going well, at least for Japan. And this led Japanese leaders to rethink their wartime strategy and to um, create the only widely accepted vision for the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And that's the vision that gets the most play these days when um, the netto uyoku, the, the right-wing net people start talking about what Japan did for Asia. So no man was more instrumental in this shift than Shigemitsu Mamoru. From 1942, while he was ambassador to Nanjing, he produced a number of widely circulated position papers that were harshly critical of this unidimensional, military first, ham-fisted nature of Japan's war. To Shigemitsu, um, he wanted he wanted Japan to win, of course, but he thought that victory depended on winning hearts and minds across Asia. And to do this, Japan had to support actual independence and equality. Japan must craft a new vision to rally Asia behind Japan and to convince Japan's enemies to make peace. So by April 1943, Tojo called on Shigemitsu to become foreign minister. And with his help, Japan supported limited independence among select countries like the Philippines and Burma, and formulated a new internationalist language for economic cooperation. And, they also, and it also called for respect for independence, respect for autonomy, and they tried to promote a cooperative regionalism. And this culminated in the Greater East Asia Conference. And it was attended by the independent, uh, with scare quotes around it, the independent states of the co-prosperity sphere. And it also led to the production of a highly idealistic joint declaration that promoted a new liberal internationalist vision for the sphere that stressed independence, autonomy, peace, cooperation, economic growth. This was the new and ultimate vision for the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, liberal internationalism. The motives behind this liberal internationalist turn were largely pragmatic. Leaders, they sought to rally Asia to make war. 
and to convince the Allied powers to make peace. So what's interesting here, and what's really interesting for me, was that um, the closer Japan came to defeat, the more Japan's leaders began to pair its co-prosperity sphere with liberal internationalist norms. So this far, I've only really talked about the Japanese side. Um, I don't have that much time left, or I'm trying to end kind of early. But um, I want to switch briefly and spend maybe like in five minutes on the Southeast Asian side of my story. Um, my book, it questions why nationalist leaders in the capitals of Manila and Rangoon actively collaborated with Japan and the ways in which they sought to benefit, at least in the short term, from such collaboration. Those Filipinos and Burmese who chose to collaborate with Japan, they received nominal independence within the co-prosperity sphere in 1943. It's easy to dismiss them as puppets but they were not mere puppets. And I, um, I ended up choosing to call these elites in the colonial capitals who worked with Japan patriotic collaborators. Burmese nationalists in Rangoon, they worked with Japan to seize independence from Great Britain, which had refused over a period of time to give either assurances of future independence, some type of constitutional advance or dominion status. Filipino governmental elites in Manila, they also went over en masse to create a caretaker regime and most sought to use the Japanese empire for anti-colonial ends. These patriotic collaborators were a major feature of World War II. I was going to say World War II in Southeast Asia, but you could, I mean, uh, if you look at Robert Paxton's book, you can make the same argument for France, or if you, um, if you look at Indonesia and, and the, all the work that's been done there, uh, they were a major feature of World War II. Their prevalence, it owes to this fact that um, political elites, especially in Southeast Asia, they found themselves caught between two empires, the invading Japanese and their former colonial masters. So uh, many found much to gain by temporary cooperation to ensure that they could bring about positive effects after war's end. And my book, it shows how this cooperation with Japan was in part a pursuit of nationalist ends. Both countries received independence in 1943. It was sham independence, but sham independence brought opportunity. So I highlight how um, Filipino and Burmese collaborationist governments, they use their independence to engage in state building projects to um, both governments created new functioning diplomatic establishments with new foreign ministries and embassies. They created new central banks that ended up not doing very much. And Burma was unique here in the institutionalization of a fully functioning defense establishment symbolized by the Burmese army and headed by a ministry of defense. And these were providing hands-on training and giving valuable experience as well. So I try not to overstate the historical impact of wartime state building. That said, there were, um, there were some legacies. For the Philippines, the main impact of the co-prosperity sphere was the creation of the diplomatic establishment. And a number of people, um, major players in the, ministry, the wartime Ministry of Foreign Affairs, went on to serve in the post-war Department of Foreign Affairs. For Burma, the main legacy was more military in nature. Um, it was really, more than anything else, the rebirth of the Burmese army. And after 1942, it was military men, not politicians or colonial officials, that would dominate the political stage in Burma. So, to end this, um, the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, it was not wholly one-sided. Um, certainly, the sphere was oppressive, it was domineering, it was brutal, but it also provided limited space that enterprising leaders in the periphery could use to their advantage. The patriotic collaborators in Manila and Rangoon, they used this space to create new governmental institutions and to gain experience in governmental affairs. Now, the defeat of Japan in 1945 and the return of the colonial 
um, empires to the Philippines and Burma, they actually undermined most of these efforts. But the wartime period still had lingering legacies well into the post-war era of decolonization. So the co-prosperity sphere is thus um, best seen as a contested process that served both imperial and anti-imperial ends. And it left its traces on Asia well after its collapse. So I went a little bit over time, but uh, thank you very much. And I guess I will stop my screen share here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, but to be honest, I, you could have carried on for another 10 minutes. I was there like, this is really good. I'm really enjoying myself. <laughs> There's all this situation. Like, yeah, yeah, don't stall. Go on. Hong, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong Academe has prepared me for well for giving very short talks. But um, I was hoping that uh, we could talk much more about this in the Q&A as well. And, and, and there are questions that are starting to sort of come in, so I would invite anyone who is um, on the webinar today, um, if you have any question or, or, or uh, sort of comments, please by all means do so. Uh, I will start sort of while, while we're collecting the first few questions together. There, there were two things that distract me. First of all, um, you know, you mentioned the, the question of um, when you look at, at, at what is happening in the Philippines and Burma and, and reading your book, uh, my mind as well run to France in the sense that this is not just something that is happening uh, in, in that part of the world, but, but this, this sort of like a expansion of empire um, and it creates, um, creates a, 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 a national level opportunities, challenges, oppression, all sorts of different sort of words come to mind. But I really, I, I was very pleased that, that, that you made that sort of, that, that quick reference in the talk because it, it really, it spoke to me. And, and, and particularly sort of the Burma case that, that one is perhaps less familiar with. It, it's absolutely, it, it comes across as a striking thing. And, and for anyone with, with a Japan expertise who's traveling towards Southeast Asia, that's also one of the reasons why sometimes in your own personal experience, you're very likely to see very different reactions. And, and those differences really draw back on the complex and sort of contested nature of, of how the simple idea is articulated, processed, and then regurgitated. And, but it is happening in a wartime experience, which in itself is, is a very complicated thing. So that, that, that to me is, is, is a massive, sort of massively important point. Um, but I also was struck by something that you, you mentioned in the book, and then you were talking about in, in, uh, in, in the talk, how the Japanese elites themselves are struggling well into 1941 and 1942 as to what exactly is that we're talking about. And, and as a military historian, for me, one of the very interesting elements of the story is how there is a, a, a lack of, 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 at least on the surface of things, uh, up until 1942-43, the great prosperity sphere doesn't seem to reconcile with the long-lasting sort of Yamagata Ritomo's inherited idea of a line of sovereignty as opposed to a line of influence. And I think there is a passage in the book in, in, in which you sort of like, you briefly mentioned it. And I was wondering whether while you were researching the greater prosperity sphere, because it is something that is also coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, was there any sort of like place where the various departments of government were interacting with each other or the confusion that you see at the Imperial Conferences level is a genuine reflection of the lack of exchange among different stakeholders over these sort of geopolitical visions of the future? So, your, so if your question, um, if I understand you correctly, um, after, well, I'm glad you talked about France because uh, Mark Pax, um, was it Mark Paxton? Is that his name? Um, who wrote the book on Vichy France. He got me thinking about collaboration in new ways. But your main question, if I understand you correctly, is how were ideas being formulated? And then how were they being hashed out and um, transformed into actual decisions? Yes. Well, so that's a very interesting and difficult question to deal with because um, it was, I mean, you can think of, um, there were plenty of stovepipes that were leading up to specific bureaucracies. The general staff had its own ideas of what should come after. They, they produced a, a document in um, 
March of 1941 mm. that um, became the, the initial policy for Japan's occupation strategy in Southeast Asia. It was drafted by three people who had no clue about or no experience in Southeast Asia, but they somehow decided that this was what Japan would do if it came to war. And that sat on you know a, a shelf collecting dust for eight months until it was resuscitated in November of 1941. And that is one case where um, a group of three officers, their ideas on the future actually had an impact. The other ideas for the sphere were being created by multiple different groups, but it was left largely to um, political intellectuals and to um, government, uh, overall government groups, which joined um, intellectuals with businessmen and whatnot. I mean, the big thing that was supposed to create the, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere was the Greater East Asia Construction Council, which was supposed to create a plan for the next 15 years. But the problem was, was that all of the groups that participated in this, they all had their own core ideas based off of economists, based off of businessmen's ideas of what the future regional economy should look like. Mm -hmm. And they could not agree. Mm -hmm. And when they could not agree, it went all the way up to liaison conferences. And the liaison conferences were the major decision makers of wartime Japan. They had to make a decision about whether to use it or not. But, you know, because the document became so watered down in the process of, you know, uh, consensus building, nothing ever happened. So this is um, a kind of a long winded way of saying, you know, uh, there were many plans, there were many groups participating, but there was no coordinated centralized structure that allowed for a true vision to emerge. It was only from 1943 when Japan was panicking that a true vision began to emerge. Does that answer your question? I it, it, it does, but it, it also reinforces something that in the liaison conferences comes across as very strongly, and that's this, uh, the, the fact that when you had big decisions to be taken, they would have to come up to that level. But the problem was that the body was not designed to make that kind of decision, and the people leading in it had different priorities in terms of what what you should take a decision upon, and and so and so and so in a way, it kind of like it's 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 incredibly interesting that the stovepipe nature of the system, right, wanted everything to go upwards, but then it did not deliver on the on on the body that was supposed to make this kind of decision. Exactly, and that body was not it was not an official body. It was a de facto body that was supposed to coordinate all the elite groups. That said. There, I mean, I did talk about it a little bit in a book. I wrote a paper on grand strategy more recently where I elaborated on this idea a lot more. Um, the very aspect of liaison conferences made decision making possible because if somebody could hijack the liaison conferences, someone like Matsuoka Yosuke, who mm -hmm. was very successful in doing so, they could guide policy. Mm -hmm. And this is why Matsuoka's iteration of the sphere was successful until around late April or May of 1941, where he kind of lost control of the beast. And it's because he was able to corral everyone onto his side. Do you think, so, so on, on top of my head, I mean, I was working on the Imperial Conferences uh, minutes, um, and one thing that always struck me is that, or, or one thing that sort of comes across is that if you look at the headlines of the agendas, for the various meetings. What happens is that from that mid-space sort of May, June 1941, the military side of the story takes over because what they started to talk about is the operational sort of aspects of expansion. And so you see ideas or figures like Mats Walker not being able to keep control, if you want, of the narrative of the discussion, simply because the agenda is not one that places the topic they can sort of 
gain leadership upon as central to the agenda. Would you would you think that is sort of uh, something that that came across your own experience? Um, well, that was actually how policymaking was supposed to work. Um, you know, uh, documents would come up. Um, if you're with the army, it would be from the um, the ministry, the Bureau of Military Affairs, mm -hmm. and it would come up to the liaison conference, and the um, army minister would want to rubber stamp it, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't spend much time talking about them and they would rubber stamp these things. And that's actually one of the processes that led Japan to war. But more the, the sidelining of Matsuoka, um, it really came because people started to think that he wasn't handling US, uh, Japan's negotiations with the US well. He was stonewalling it. And then once the war against, um, once the German Soviet war heated up, um, people started to think that he went crazy. So. It's, so there's a, a number of other reasons why he wasn't able to shepherd policy in the direction that he wanted to. Brilliant. Okay, so now we've got lots of questions. And um, just for the purpose of those who, who have been typing their questions into the chat, um, I, will, I will try to get them all and, and, and sort of create a bit of a, a narrative that follows on of this conversation. Um, Two, which, which leads to two initial questions that, that really sort of follow up um, on what we've been discussing. Um, one thing, of course, is um, um, Bill Hayton is, is asking, could the sphere have ever become a progressive egalitarian space? Or was it always predicated upon a sense of Japanese superiority? Uh, that's actually a, a very good question. And I kind of I tangentially deal with it in, in mm -hmm. my book. Um, so the question is, what point are we talking about? If Japan was able to establish the sphere in the middle of 1942, and they were able to, you know, um, gain control over much of Asia in the process, and they got the great powers to recognize them, then no, it would not have been an egalitarian space. It would not have been progressive. Um, it would have definitely have been um, predicated, as you said, upon this sense of superiority. But from 1943, things change. And in this point where, um, in, the, in the lead up to the Greater East Asia Conference, where Japan begins to um, promote limited independence to places throughout the sphere and promotes a new ideology of cooperation, mm -hmm. of regionalism, of um, uh, ideology that's promoting the abolition of racial discrimination. I mean, that's more, if we're talking liberal internationalism, this is more Wilsonian than Wilson. Um, you could make an argument that they might have been bound by this new ideology that they were creating. You know, whether they want to, the co-prosperity sphere to remain, um, you know, a Japanese dominated space is one question, but would they have been able to do so? And what's really interesting and what I talk about a little bit in the book is how after um, Japan promoted this, I, I call it the Pacific Charter because it's in relation to the Atlantic Charter, but it's really called the Greater East Asia Joint Declaration. That's the official name of the document. Mm -hmm. After they promote this, all of a sudden, their partners across Asia start coming out and saying, well, what about us? Why aren't we getting independence too? So the Vietnamese come out and they say, well, what about us? Why aren't we going to the Greater East Asia Conference? And then the Filipinos who did go to the conference, they, um, President Jose Laurel, he um, sent a message to the Japanese saying, well, look at what you're doing in the Philippines. You are beating us, you, uh, are, um, you are slapping us, you are requisitioning laboratories that we need to advance Filipino production. How is this aligned with either our Pact of Alliance or the Greater East Asia Joint Declaration? Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens in Burma as well. So there's no, ev there's no evidence, or at least I didn't find any evidence that the Japanese budged in any way on these questions, but um, the very act of creating this ideology, I feel it might have bound Japan um, had the empire survived into the post-war. 
Uh, and there is also a point there that as by, by 1944, the, the, the evaluation of what you can and cannot allow to do is very different because the resources are not coming through uh, or not as, as they, they, they used to. So the, 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 the valuation, the calculations in Tokyo as well are changing incredibly. So you're absolutely right. But it's a, there's a question of timing, right? The moment they start coming out, as you said, um, with this important statement is also the least congenial point for them to act upon it uh, because everything that they need to do push them in a different direction. Yeah, so I mean, you could look at it as a statement that supports empire and undermines it at the same time. Bravo, exactly. That's, that's exactly the thing that I have. Okay, so we've got, based on this, I'm going to take two questions together that are really interesting and they speak to, um, to, to some of the, 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 uh, the background to your story. Uh, in the sense that in, in the talk, you very much sort of start with 1940 and the rule that Matt Walker has, because that's where formally this idea is, is, um, is declared. Um, but I've got two questions, one from Jeff and another one that is slightly different from uh, you, Faye uh, but they are related in the sense that where does Matt Walker's idea come from? Is this something that was already part of uh, ideas that within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs diplomats were discussing. Um, was Mats Walker's own thing that came at that point? Um, and was there any sort of process of borrowing from others? Say, for example, Hitler's concept loosely defined as a new order. Um, so was what happens in 1940 something that is Mats Walker's child or is part of a bigger process that one needs to look a bit further back, and if so, where are the sources of inspiration? And, and Yufei Li pushes this even further with the specific question of Manchuria. If Manchuria at the beginning is part of the uh, original sort of uh, definition of the greater core prosperity sphere, does that mean that the ideational logic behind it is the same that you could push back down to 1905 and the beginning of the continental expansion of Japan on mainland uh, China? Well, mainland um, yeah, these are very interesting questions. If you are going to push back as far as you can, I think the critical turning point is World War I. Mm. Um, I wouldn't go as far as the Russo-Japanese War. Um, but to, and I talk about this actually in the introduction. So if you get the book and if you feel like reading it, then uh, there's like maybe five or six pages in the introduction that are dealt, uh, that are dealing with this. But where was Matsuoka getting these ideas from? Um, well, it didn't just emerge in, 19, um, in 1940. There was a much longer process. A lot of it had to do with reactions to the Washington Treaty System that had been constructed in the early 1920s with um, the destruction of the Washington Treaty System um, in the mid 1930s, really 1937, Japan had already decided to go its own and create, a, you know, um, a regionalist vision for East Asia, and it was called the New Order in East Asia, and that was um, part of the brainchild of the Konoe administration in, mm -hmm. um, in yes, in 1937, 38, 38. I'm sorry, 1938. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a longer history behind it. Um, I don't think that Matsuoka created the, and this is, I'm going off on a tangent here. I don't think that Matsuoka created the term um, Greater East or East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. I found it in um, foreign ministry documents even bef um, a few months before Matsuoka stated or uh, announced the establishment of the co-prosperity sphere. So I think, you know, he was just um, borrowing terminology that was pre-existing, but I haven't found, you know, the source of this term co-prosperity sphere, if that's what you were asking. Yeah. Um, it, ha it definitely has traces back to ideologies of, um, what is it, uh, coexistence and co-prosperity that uh, Japan was promoting back in the World War One era as well, so I I don't know if I'm answering your question well, but uh... no, I, but I think this is the you know um, I think that that allows us to sort of 
get a sense. And, and I think the critical point is really to take away is that the exercise of going back, you need to, very, very, to, be, you need to be careful and you need to sort of engage you with the specific of the content of these ideas to, de, to see the extent to which there are continuities or just accidental sort of places that, that are more the, the, you know, the brainchild of geopolitics and geography rather than a conscious a sort of going back and, and stretching back as far as the early 1900s. Now, um, there's, um, um, I'm conscious of the time and um, we've got quite a few questions still coming in, but there's one thing very quickly, um, one of the, so one of the, um, uh, one of our guests today uh, says, I'm a Filipino and in school we are told about uh, this uh, with the Japanese having the intent of Asia for Asians, but didn't really cover your view um, as a, an opportunity for nationalists to actually experience, gain experience of self-governance. Do you think it has helped further to develop the, the anti-colonial sentiments during that time? Or, because he's saying, you know, from my perspective, it, the, for the Philippines, it doesn't seem to be the case as we were pro-American in our perception then as we are today. What is your sort of um, uh, feeling in terms of how much it fostered that national... Mm. All sentiment? right, so the Philippines is a difficult story. It's, it's a very difficult story. And the reason it's a difficult story was because um, it was not a place that was largely pro-Japanese. They were highly pro-American. Mm -hmm. They were highly pro-American. And it was the place with the biggest um, guerrilla movement. I mean, I'm sure you learned about the Huck Balahap um, movement as well. It was the place where you had millions of people who were fighting against the Japanese as well. So it's not like all of a sudden the Filipinos raised up their arms and said, oh, we welcome you with open arms. They did not. So the story of the, that I'm telling of the Philippines is a little bit different than the story. Actually, it's very different than the story I tell about Burma because the Philippines, they did not welcome the Japanese. But empire arrived and they had to deal with it and the ways in which they dealt with it um, allowed them in some ways to gain specific types of experience in governmental affairs they had no st uh, they had no central bank beforehand and they went to ja japan to learn about um, creating central banks they had uh, no department i'm sorry a, a ministry of foreign affairs before and under in the wartime regime of Jose Laurel, they had their first Ministry of Foreign Affairs with an embassy mm. in Tokyo. And they had to engage with this process of dealing with foreign countries. Um, mm. And before it was all the nacionalista oligarchy that was doing this on a personal level, but now it was institutionalized. And what's interesting with the Philippines is that the, um, I, I, I think it's like something like 60% of the higher positions in, um, uh, in the bureaucracy, in the foreign ministry bureaucracy yeah. during the wartime, they ended up moving directly into the Department of Foreign Affairs after independence. So, and, you know, the perfect example of this is Leon Guerrero, who ended up serving as a vice minister of foreign affairs in mm. 1954. So, I'm, I'm um, trying to more highlight these connections between what Japan did, or rather what Filipino collaborationists did, and their future in building institutions that um, went on to have post or afterlives in the area of decolonization. The Philippines was still very pro-American and they were one of the real cold warriors in Asia because of this. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, I, maybe my argument came across a little bit differently because I'm, I'm painting with these big brush strokes, but I, I go into a lot more detail in the book. Brilliant. And to, um, I want to just go over with you on, on a couple of very short questions, really, quite, quite specific. Um, and then we, we, we move towards the sort of like, uh, if you want, the long term uh, relevance and impact of the book uh, with a couple of questions about links with today. But before we do so, two very quick things. Uh, did Japan ever view India as part of the sphere or was there more a propaganda opportunity against the Britain? Um, and, and in that regards, that's from Judith. And also John is asking about um, whether it would extend 
the point you made about in the talk that there was no, you know, the, the great um, core prosperity sphere was not really a grand strategy. Was it due because it never really reached to a stage that you had a coordinated grand strategic statement with clear priorities in it and, okay. and, and more in sort of the remain like a stovepipe process as it were. So okay. two quick question, was India part of the gig or was it just for propaganda reasons? And was the stovepipe nature of the decision-making mechanism reason why you don't see it as a grand strategy. All right, um, so can I share my screen really quickly? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so um, where was it here, share, boom, okay, let's get rid of this. So um, why is this not working? Uh, because it's slower. Ah, there you go. So, I mean, if you notice at, the, at um, here, you have, um, uh, you have Subhash Chandra Bose here at the Greater East Asia conference. That's what I wanted to show you. Um, I noticed somebody else um, wrote a question about uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Um, India mm. was too, probably, <laughs> it depends. So it was probably to be a part. And that's actually really one of the interesting things is um, why did Burma get independence? Mm. Well, the reason they got independence is because Japanese leaders thought that Burma having independence would spur on Indian nationalists to demand to seize independence from the British and then to join forces. Of course, Japan also sponsored the Indian National Army, um, which eventually was led by Subhash Chandra Bose. So, you know, there's a very real reason that Japan saw India as a huge part of the sphere. In fact, it was so much more important than Burma, and it's why Burma got independence. Um, the second question was on grand strategy. And why um, you don't think that the co-prosperity sphere was not a grand strategy? So, um, grand strategy needs to have two components. It needs to have vision on the one hand, and then tactics that are, you know, reasonably understandable tactics that you can use to achieve that. Japan had vision in spades, mm. but it did not have tactics. And even when it had um, a clear cut policy, Japan was never able to control the, um, the central government was never able to control the actions of the army and navy in the periphery. So um, without being able to coordinate elite interests, there's no way grand strategy would have been possible. So, I mean, this is one of the, one of the interesting things. Um, this was a wartime creation. Because I noticed somebody might have asked, I think someone asked about um, the, the contemporary Chinese version and the differences yeah, between yeah, the Japanese so version. Yeah, so yeah. The, the Japanese version, it was a wartime creation. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, it was very difficult for leaders to get their acts together and to, um, to affect control over the variety of policies ne necessary to institute a grand strategy. Whereas mm -hmm. China today, this is a peacetime mm -hmm thing, uh, so, uh, for lack of a better word. So because this is a peacetime entity, it's much more likely to have a, a, a more long-lasting influence on the regional structure of Asia than Japan could have when it was engaged in global war. Mm. And uh, I suppose also it ties with the question of a sense of urgency of, of having to prioritize and think long and hard what to prioritize, which, which in wartime is essential. Yeah. And at this time, you've got, you've got time, you know, time is on your side. In yes. um, very briefly, and, and I'm going to apologize to those, uh, because some of the, the, the last questions left are, are, are very important and excellent questions, but also kind of complex, and I don't think we have the time. Uh, so I will close on, on this last one. Uh, what are the traces of the greater East Asian core prosperity sphere that can be linked today with the concept of Asian regionalism? Well, um, so... Lots of the same terminology that um, was used in world in World War II era Japan is now being used in contemporary China. Um, I'm gonna type in the chat for which should I panelists and attendees? Is that how I do it? The the term for those of you who read it is um, 
Umekyodotai. I don't know what it is in Chinese, so I'm just typing it in Japanese. Uh, Umekyodotai in Japanese. That is, um, that is what Xi Jinping is uh, touting, at least from 2017, as the fundamental ideology behind his new BRI initiatives, that, that there is a community of common destiny, community of, or community of fate. The difference between them, so there's um, a very clear connection there in the, the, the lexicon that's used to describe it. That said, they're very different things. In World War II, it was minzoku, it was minzoku, sorry for writing in Japanese, minzoku, that was the unme kyodotai. It was the, the people, it was the, uh, the ethnic groupings. That, so really it was the Japanese, it was the Japanese themselves that were the community of fate. Whereas um, Xi Jinping's, um, his is a very different entity because I, I, what I assume he's trying to get at with this is um, the community of fate is, or community of common destiny is all of Asia that is working with China. Mm. So uh, in, in some senses, they're, they're very similar. And in other senses, they're very, very, very different. Even the similarities are different. Uh, so that, uh, I don't know if you call like the, the Japanese co-prosperity sphere, co-prosperity sphere version one and the current one version two, people have been doing that. But um, because one was a wartime entity and the other is a peacetime entity, you have to see them as totally separate beasts. No, I'm, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and the fact that they talk about um, a sense of community or they're trying to appeal to a sense of community, it, it's part of, it, it seems like a logical choice rather than a conscious sort of effort um, in, in that regard. And, and the point you were making about the difference is the idea of Minzoku very much has got an ethnic uh, connotation that it certainly does not have in the, in the, in the more contemporary sort of... Uh, uh, a reincarnation of, of this notion of, of, of original spirit. Um, Jeremy, as I said, we could carry on for a couple of hours. hours. It would be unfair to you, given the fact that in Hong Kong uh, it's quite late and you've been extremely generous with your time. Um, but, but it's been an, an absolutely genuine pleasure. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time um, and, and, and sort of um, engaging with us uh, on this for this wonderful conversation. Um, again, a fantastic book um, and um, best of luck with it. And, and we're looking forward to more of your work and uh, more opportunity to get together. Thank you very much. And before I leave, um, if I could just say thank you as well. And for those of you who, who um, want to engage in conversations with me, I'm on Twitter and I'm also easily accessible online. So um, please I can send me vouch for that. I can vouch for He answers on Twitter. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's true. Um, my, PhD uh, students, uh, my PhD students say it's easier to get a hold of me on Twitter than it is in real life. Mine too. I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to get a hold of me on WhatsApp and Twitter than it is in real life. Sometimes. So, the, the, touch are the, the times we live in. Uh, having said this, thank you very much for everyone to uh, stay on with us today and for the absolutely terrific questions and comments that we got through. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye for now. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.